webinar with Catherine Bussard. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction and then Catherine's going to take over the, the talk. Um, Catherine is a, the Peter C. Bunnell Curator of Photography at the Princeton University Art Museum. In 2014, um, Kate co-authored an award-winning publication exploring the intersection of photography, architecture, and urban studies. That book and the accompanying exhibition were entitled The City Lost and Found, Capturing New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980. She's also the co-author of Color Rush, American Color, Photography from Stieglitz to Sherman in 2013, and author of the So, so, so the Story Goes, Photography from Tina Barney, Philip Lorca de Corsia, Nan Golden, Sally Mann, and Larry Sultan. Um, one little thing I wanted to say to our attendees is that um, please feel free to, uh, to write in the chat to ask us questions, um, to ask questions to Kate. We'll, after the presentation or even sort of possibly during, we can, we can answer questions or she can answer questions. Um, uh, and it, as the salons we do in Dormar, it's very relaxed. So please feel free to comment. Okay. And right. also just to say that Kate, was a Brown Foundation fellow here in 2017. I was. I was just going to start with that um, to say that part of what is such a pleasure to be with you um, is is to sort of give something back uh, to the Dora Mar House after uh, the really transformative four weeks that I spent there in 2017, which um, involved reading. I forget how many books I had stacked up in my office there, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, copious amounts of books uh, around the history of photojournalism and Life magazine. So the reading and thinking that I did at Dora Mar House became the bedrock for everything I'm going to show you tonight um, for you all. And yeah, definitely welcome questions. So please drop them in. Um, and uh, I've left plenty of time for questions at the end. So I will just dive in now. Are you all seeing my screen? I can see it. Lovely. OK, so okay. Life Magazine and the Power of Photography. Um, I'm showing you here um, just so that we can um, appreciate that it happened. I am showing you here uh, the installation view of the exhibition, which opened February 22nd of this year at the Princeton University Art Museum. And uh, it was able to be on view for three weeks. Um, we do, I'll show you one more installation view. We put this exhibition together with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And we do anticipate that this exhibition will open there, um, not before probably the middle of next year, but we're waiting on final dates. So these are really kind of teasers um, for those of you who might ever find yourself in Boston um, to uh, keep an eye out. What I really wanted to focus on today is the book that accompanied the exhibition. Um, I'm showing you here the cover on the left and then um, the opening title page on the right. Um, and one of the things I hope you see right from the very start is that this um, was a highly collaborative uh, undertaking and that we enlisted um, no fewer than 25 scholars to put together the, um, the contributions, um, some short essays, some sort of object lessons and some longer essays, um, including another Dora Mar uh, resident, uh, Amanda Maddox. So um, the, it, the tradition continues. It's a so, lovely book. I'm just gonna <laughs> it's really amazing. <laughs> so what I thought I'd do is start us off with just some you know, very basic information. Um, published weekly from 1936 to 1972, Life Magazine was visually revolutionary and extraordinarily popular. During this period, Life Magazine featured 120,000 photo stories selected from around 10 million photographs. At its height, Life Magazine reached approximately 25% of the US population. I'm gonna let that sink in because there's no media outlet today that reaches 25% of the US population. And Life Magazine used images in ways that fundamentally shaped how its readers understood photography and how they experienced key historical events. 
Our discoveries and those of many of our book contributors shed new light on the collaborative process behind many now iconic images and photographic stories. And of course, here you're seeing six editors um, within the first year of Life Magazine's publication sifting through some of these hundreds of photographs as they consider what should be published. One aspect of our project has been how life photographs were made. So that is the getting of the picture. On being given an assignment, a photographer would frequently work with a researcher creating what was called a story building team. And then they would head out with a reporter guidelines in hand. Here you see Gordon Parks, who was um, a life staff photographer, um, deplaning, because of course life photographers were sent around the world. And after a photographer like Gordon Parks finished the shoot, he would send his negatives to a negative editor. This was the person who would look at all the negatives a photographer submitted for a particular assignment and then winnow it down to the images that they felt should be considered for the printed page. Here we see Peggy Sargent with a strip of negatives from which she will select those to be enlarged for editorial consideration. The next step in the process would be, as we see here, picture editor Natalie Kosek reviewing the photographs. She and a primarily male editorial team, it must be said, would choose final images and determine how to adapt them for the printed page. The success of life's form of presentation of photographs led to a huge variety of what we would call copycats magazines. And so you see Life's first cover from November of 1936 on the left, and then a grid of six that are just, you know, a sampling of the many, uh, many picture magazines that followed Life magazine and imitated it. In particular, you see the dominant use of red at the bottom band and often behind the name of the magazine itself. It is really striking how, how very similar they are. So our scholarship for the book drew on unprecedented access to Life Magazine picture and paper archives, which are conveniently stored in two totally different locations. <laughs> um, and we brought together original press prints contact sheets, shooting scripts, internal memos, like the um, telegram I'm showing you on the left. And I thought I would give you an example of the kind of information we found using this iconic image that graced the first cover of Life magazine, which was taken by uh, Life's first woman staff photographer, Margaret Burke White. And so, you know, the, the finished uh, cover is on the right, but on the left, we have this telegram where she's writing back to life's offices, uh, reassuring them that she's doing all possible um, in photographing Fort Peck Dam's construction with the changeable light. Um, and, and of course we see the light plays such a crucial element in the articulation of the forms of the dam's construction. So this telegram was in the paper archives. When we went to the picture archives, we were able to find this vintage press print. So this is the image that would have been selected for enlargement. This is maybe about eight by 10 inches. Um, and the great revelation here was that this image was composed by Margaret Burke White through her camera as a horizontal image which I have to say, not a single Margaret Burke White scholar in the nation had known um, before we found this press print. And here I'm showing you the back of that print so that you can get an idea of how um, active an object these press prints were. So this is the back of that photograph. Um, it has different categories written on the back. So you see patterns, dams, um, it has stamps, indicating when and where it was published, um, different um, instructions not to circulate it because at some point this image became, uh, as you see, a famous picture for Life magazine. And they didn't want uh, it to be borrowed from the picture collection and not returned. 
here's another iconic Life magazine photograph. This is J.R. Ironman's 1952 image of captivated moviegoers wearing 3D glasses. Um, we have a wonderful essay in the book that contextualizes this image um, within life's coverage of Hollywood and celebrity culture. Um, but what I wanna look at today is how this image becomes iconic. Well, it would start with that negative editor I mentioned, sorry, leave it on that, um, who would select the frame for enlargement. Um, and what we know from J.R. Ironman's photo shoot is illuminated by this document we found uh, on the right, where this is the notes from the reporter who was sent to photograph the 3D film. And what you see is that the reporter thinks that the story is the 3D technology. But of course, it's really impossible for J.R. Ironman to photograph the 3D technology of what was the first full length color feature in 3D. That's almost impossible to photograph um, with a still image. And so instead, J.R. Ironman decides that he'll turn his camera um, and we see this on the contact sheet, he'll turn his camera to the, you know, kind of uniform, almost zombie-like uh, watchers of the 3D film. And this, um, this kind of move by the photographer away from the original brief of 3D technology ends up being something that Life uh, Magazine, its editorial uh, team ends up running with. So they, with this spread that was published on the right, I'm suggesting that, of course, they, as an editorial team, decide to showcase this image as a kind of singular, uh, you know, singular evocation of, um, of entertainment, right? Um, and very little about the 3D technology is printed um, on the small text that accompanies it. Now I'm guessing almost everyone on, on this call uh, knows this image. This is Alfred Eisenstadt's kiss in Times Square on VJ Day. Um, it's an image that it has been quoted and appropriated and reprised more times than um, I can keep track of. Um, and what I found particularly illuminating about the photograph, which has this kind of singularity in its fame, um, was that when we look at the printed spread of Life Magazine, um, which anyone can do, I should say at this moment that Life Magazine is available on Google Books, so it's incredibly searchable. So a quick search would, would sort of lead to this observation that is, it didn't appear alone. It appeared alongside lots of other images of lots of other such kisses. Um, if you, uh, you'll see the names of the locations. So the, the title for the spread is the Men of War Kiss from Coast to Coast, but you see the upper left photo calls out Washington, the photo next to it, Kansas City, and the lower photo is Miami. And then of course, on the right, the full page is given over to this kiss in New York. So that's something that we could have discovered just by looking at the magazine itself. What we didn't know, and what I don't, I don't know if anyone knew before, was that there were actually four shots of this kiss uh, taken by Eisenstadt. And I'm showing you on the left, the contact sheet of his strip of film, including the one selected uh, with the red pencil. And you can start to see that they're already um, playing with and imagining how it might be cropped for the printed page. So you see um, a sense of how not only the one image was selected from the four, but then when we get to the spread that has four images, we can see how much pride of place this image was given on the published spread. This is one of my favorite photo essays um, in, the, in the book. Um, and uh, another Margaret Burke White effort uh, here, although Margaret Burke White is famous for covering um, battles in World War II, uh, this is one of the assignments she was given while she was briefly stateside during World War II. Um, I'm showing you the cover image uh, on the left from August of 1943, which just says steel worker. Um, 
But if you look closely, you might observe the delicacy of the features or rather full lips, um, or you might go in and look at that badge that's at the, um, at the top button of the shirt and realize that that ID badge has a woman's name on it. So this is in, is in fact a woman steel worker. What we have here is, you know, a kind of rosy riveter, right? Um, and the image I'm showing you on the right is that same steel worker um, in a portrait that appears on the inside story of, of these women who are um, keeping the steel mills around Gary, Indiana functioning during the war. And here's that, that page where um, the women appear uh, in this kind of, uh, I've, I've thought of it almost as like a yearbook kind of grid um, where Margaret Burke White has clearly photographed each of these individuals um, painstakingly from the same distance, um, framing them, uh, you know, full in the, in the frame. Um, and as she does that, she's captured critical details about each one. So you get their name. You also get sometimes a bit about their origin. You always get their age. Um, so for example, um, the woman in the upper left is a Croatian and she has uh, two children. The woman in the middle uh, is um, African-American and uh, gives the name of the steel, steel mill she works at. Um, we also have the woman below her who is called out as being of Mexican descent. And then many of the women on the page are also, it notes, taking the position at the steel mill that was occupied by a brother, a father, a boyfriend, or a husband. And so each of these women is then connected to, um, you know, someone uh, deployed in the war effort. So there's a tethering of, of domestic war effort with international war effort and all accomplished by these really skillful portraits by Margaret Burke White, where she's focusing so carefully on the women's faces. And just to drive home how obvious it is that that was a choice Margaret Burke White made, I wanna be sure to show you the opening spread for the photo essay, which you know is, if it didn't say women in steel on the page, might just look like steel workers assumed to be men at work. Um, and this is a this is a wonderful example of how you know these are the kind of industrial shots uh, that would have that would have been um, what Margaret Burke White was expected to get from this assignment. But the portraits um, that appear in the middle of the story really accomplish something quite different for articulating what the war effort looks like. So one of the great mysteries for us as we thought about how photographs happen like how do you get you know a layout like this with that grid of the nine faces and then the other one to the left right how did those layouts come to be right these would have all been mocked up at life's offices and mock-ups of every single page of the magazine would have been sent to the printing company in chicago but working with the Time Inc. archivist who's been there for 40 years and working with the staff of the picture collection who've been working with the picture collection for just as long, no one had ever found a layout mock-up. And um, we were really delighted to be able to uh, showcase some newly discovered layout mock-ups. I'm showing you just one here. Um, and it's, you know, it. I mean, there's some wonderful details here, right? Like aside from the rubber cement stains for those of us who are old enough to have worked with rubber cement, um, you see that it's on gridded paper and that the grid has these dark lines around the edge that actually show you the trim size of Life Magazine, which was of course very generous in size. When it was opened, it was 11 inches tall by 21 inches across. So it was very enveloping when it was um, opened in front of your face. And you see that it also anticipates what we call the gutter of the publication. That is where the stapling would happen um, and where the image would sort of fall into that, that crack. Other things that I think are key to notice is that the text is secondary. They have very little interest in even pretending that they have a headline for this story yet. What they're really doing is playing with the image's prominence on the, play, on the page 
and where it's going to be placed in relation to the other uh, photographs. So this is a photograph, uh, a story shot by Gordon Parks, um, and it appears um, the the inset photo, the little one, uh, is appears in the very first story that Gordon Parks does on the boy here, Flavio da Silva, um, which is something Amanda has worked on deeply. So I I, I borrow from her knowledge heavily here, um, and this is indeed what she wrote about for our book. Um, Flavio da Silva is living in a, a favela outside of Rio. Gordon Parks does a feature on him in June 1961, and life readers, uh, including some doctors at an asthma institute in Denver, Colorado, offer to assist Flavio. Uh, he suffers debilitating asthma from the conditions of the favela. And so what we actually see here in the larger photo is Gordon Parks traveling to the Asthma Institute with Flavio, photographing his meetings with the doctors. But watch what happens as the layouts uh, advance. So I just showed you the one in the upper left. Now we have another one where that same photo of Flavio with the doctors is no longer spread across both pages. That is, it's no longer 21 inches across, but it is more than half of the magazine spread. Also, the photo to remind you of the conditions that Flavio came from in contrast to the, the medical photo uh, is getting slightly larger on the page. And in this one, we see the introduction of a completely different photograph. So no longer is the, the medical photo dominating where it has to be said Flavio looks uh, a little worried. Um, here we see a beaming Flavio on a swing um, with a, a, maybe a classmate or a friend behind him. Um, and the inset photograph has again become quite uh, a bit larger on the page. And here is the published layout. So now it all comes together. The title is finally assigned based on the chosen layout. And it says the compassion of Americans brings a new life for Flavio. And so with that title, of course, it can only be the swing photograph because who would see a, a positive new life in these worried photographs of doctors examining x-rays. But it's easy to see a kind of buoyant new life uh, in the swing picture here. But also, of course, the photographs have become almost equal in size and they end up kind of uh, replicating what we might think of as a before and after kind of treatment of photographs, which we're really familiar with, I think, today. So with that um, exploration of a published layout, thanks to these newly discovered mock-ups, I want to have us look at a, another um, layout, also from the 1960s, um, uh, it's a difficult one. Um, it's from the 1963 church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, this is the spread that Life Magazine chooses to publish. It reproduces only one image, right? So there's not a play between images happening here. And this is really critical because the editors would have had hundreds of photographs to choose from. The photographer, uh, Frank Dandridge, was on assignment in Birmingham for two full weeks um, and turned in dozens of rolls of film. But the one image is paired with a text from a white Birmingham lawyer who emphatically laid the blame for this racial violence on all white people who have spread hatred. Quote, who is really guilty? Each of us end quote. And so we found a vintage print of this photograph in the Life Picture Collection. It's the only vintage print known to exist. Um, there are none in museum collections. There are none in galleries. This is, we think, the only one. Um, but then we found this other vintage print, probably taken moments before or moments after, uh, showing the same girl, Sarah Jean Collins, in the hospital bed. Um, and what happens with this image, um, because I've always found this image quite powerful, but I wasn't sure that I was able to articulate the source of the power of the image. Um, and this, this uh, kind of outtake, if you will, this image not chosen 
really helped me uh, articulate what I found so moving about the photograph. Um, slight digression here. We actually tracked Frank Dandridge down after opening the exhibition. He's still alive and lives in LA and has long since left the photography world, but he remembers this shoot. Um, and he uh, let us know that because he was on assignment in Birmingham with a life reporter, that life reporter who's also black, Frank Dandridge is black, uh, the reporter was black, they gained access to Sarah Jean Collins's family. And so what the woman you see here pictured on the left is actually Sarah Jean Collins's mother who has taken the life photographer and life reporter with her to her daughter's bedside in the hospital. And this is really important because this also means this is the mother of one of the murdered girls. So she's standing bedside over one daughter knowing that she's already lost another daughter. And part of what I came to realize the power of the photograph was is that to make the image that Dandridge, that ends up being published, Dandridge had to stand in her spot, right? So I'll show you that again, the view right, the view down into the bed is, can only be uh, photographed in the way it's shown here if Frank Dandridge stands right beside her where the mother was standing. And it, so I, I came to realize that it's this, it's this, not just the proximity of the image, not just that it's very, very intimate, but that it feels like it, it evokes that familial concern of the mother bedside. And I think that changed my understanding of the spread entirely. Now, this is one of the JFK assass assassination film stills. Um, you know, you'll certainly recognize it. Uh, this is um, part of an eight millimeter film taken by um, you know, uh, uh, an amateur, um, uh, Abraham Zapruder. Uh, Life magazine ex uh, secured exclusive rights to the film. Uh, within hours of the assassination. This is the part of the story that we already knew. Um, we also already knew that Life Magazine uses those film stills in not just one issue of Life Magazine, but multiple. So here I'm showing you the regular weekly issue that comes out um, is actually stopped on the presses because of the assassination um, and reconfigured to include this content. So this is the uh, regular weekly edition. And here I'm showing you the way that the film stills, which of course were filmed in color, the way that those film stills are used um, in the commemorative issue that is published, that, that is a tribute to JFK and uh, the proceeds of which uh, actually go to help found the JFK library. But the big discovery here was just how contested this decision to move from black and white images of the Zapruder film to color images was. Um, what I'm showing you is an internal memo from the art director in 1963, Bernard Quint, writing to one of the senior managers, calling into question the decision to print these in color. And he states it in very extreme terms. He does not believe it serves any scientific or educational purpose. He instead fears that it would feed those who are already morbid and depraved enough to derive excitement from it. And he goes further saying that if Life Magazine chooses to publish the film stills in color, he believes it will so damage the American psyche that he could not remain associated in any way with Life Magazine and would be forced to resign and state so publicly. And this memo for, for me was this confirmation that everyone along the chain of the process, not just the photographers and not just the senior editors, but everyone along that chain was thinking really critically about photographs, about how they could be used and about the, the meanings that they might convey. Um, and so Bernard Quint does indeed stay at Life Magazine, even though they published them in color. But just the fact that he felt compelled to write this memo and reveal how crucially he was thinking about the appearance of the images on the pages of the magazine is I think really a testament to that kind of photographic forward thinking that Life Magazine embodied during its weekly run. And my final example of that kind of forward uh, thinking when it came to photographs 
is the NASA uh, moon landing on in 1969. Here I'm showing you uh, a photograph by Don Vida uh, that captures so perfectly how many people watched the moon landing. And that is exactly, they watched it in, in you know, broadcast over their televisions as very grainy black and white footage. Um, it was an ephemeral occurrence. Um, and once it was done, that was it. Life Magazine, however, had begun uh, about a decade prior, had begun a pretty exclusive relationship with the astronauts and their families. And this meant that the beautiful color photographs made by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon were able to be utilized by Life Magazine, um, gracing their weekly cover. Here I'm showing you August 8th, 1969 cover. Um, printed in pretty lavish, uh, you know, to pretty lavish production standards. Um, we can talk more if anyone's interested, but Life Magazine of all the picture magazines really prided itself on the, the thickness of its paper, the gloss of its paper, the expense it went to when it was printing with color inks. Um, and the moon landing is, is perfect for them to make use of this. So the other media outlets had NASA's images, but they weren't able to generate the same kind of quality when it came to their regular coverage. Um, and of course, that quality also extends to the special edition that Life puts out um, to commemorate the moon landing. And it does this all sort of um, as a way to set itself apart from televised coverage of news events. This is the late 1960s. More and more people are tuning into television more and more advertisers are choosing television over magazines. And this is life's kind of last ditch attempt to stake a claim in what it does well. And that is gorgeous, compelling photographs, lavishly printed in something that you could hold in your hands long after the moment was gone. Life Magazine ceases circulation just a few years later, its last issue comes out in December of 1972. And although there are later reboots, none of them had the same kind of power and impact that Life Magazine had when it was a weekly from 1936 to 1972. So that's just a bit of what this book contains. And um, now I would, I would love to, uh, would love to, try to answer questions. So let's see if- If anyone can, yeah, you can t type in the chat. If type you... in the chat, please. Um, and uh, I, I can ask a question to start things off. Um, you, you mentioned um, that, well, in the end, TV was really, TV advertising was really the end of, of life. It was also the end of look, which I, you know. Right. You know, um, it, um, but it, it, the way it, it changed the way people did it, how, how would you say that it changed the way people looked at photography? I mean, in a way that journalism sort of changed because of it, right? I mean, wasn't that? There's a, so this is such a good question. And it, it actually is gonna dovetail with a question from Mary Flanagan. What was the demise of Life Magazine, but not Time, for example? So I'll try to answer both because there's, there's multiple factors at play. Advertising dollars is certainly one piece of the story and television is another piece of the story. But you're right to call out uh, Look's Demise, which happens in 1971, just one year before. Um, the other magazine that uh, folded even earlier um, was uh, the Saturday Evening Post. And Life Magazine took a gamble and bought the subscription list for Saturday Evening Post which was close to 7 million. And it added that to its roster, which at, I'm trying to remember was well over 10 million um, in the late 1960s. And so it ballooned its subscription and then had to deliver magazines at a time of increasing production costs and increasing postage rates. And so they basically stretched themselves, like it's a classic, they stretched themselves too thin and they weren't able to actually keep generating the kind of product 
that they were known for without taking a severe loss because now they were doing it for 7 million more subscribers. Right. So it's also a, a story of overextending, you know, um, of reaching too far. Um, and, and I think that's a key piece of it. I think the other piece, and this is harder to like prove, I guess I want to say, but the other piece is that Life Magazine is a vehicle that believes, uh, believes and wants to achieve the kind of myth of a homogenous post-war US middle class, right? And they, they want that American dream. Uh, they want to see it succeed. Um, it comes with a lot of biases, it should be said, and we can dig into that if anyone's interested. Um, but I think that the upheavals, the social, cultural, political upheavals of the 1960s really uh, fractured Life Magazine's ability to keep putting forward a kind of unified sense of what the US was. Mm -hmm. I think that by the late 60s, they were, confused about what to do with the sexual revolution. They were worried about black power and didn't quite get why there might be violence. And they certainly didn't really have a lot good to say about hippies or drug culture, right? <laughs> and all, all of these things are kind of undermining their sense of, of the of their Mission. imagined ideal reader for all those years. And so I that was a, that's a harder one because it's not a dollars and cents thing, but you can see it in the content as the years, you know, as you watch from mid 60s to 1972, that last issue, you can see the content, they're mm -hmm. so erratic. Um, and the Vietnam War is a huge part of that. I mean, Life Magazine is, um, you know, has a strong nationalist bent and it wanted to support the Vietnam War and it really did for, well, certainly well past Henry Luce's lifetime. Um, you know, they do run the really chilling spread of one week's right. dead. Um, but by then I think you see that the editors know that the writing is on the wall and they're struggling to, they're struggling to kind of maintain an audience. Okay. There, there was a question earlier that I thought was really interesting. Well, there are many interesting questions, but one was, why did they send the layouts to the printers and how much input did they give, the actual printers give to layout? So I- said you know the layouts with the printer. Yes, yeah, so, so Don, R. R. Donnelly and Sons was the exclusive printer and we have a fabulous essay um, in the book by Ellen Handy who uh, writes in, in really compelling detail about the technological advances that Donnelly and Sons, um, you know, introduced to make Life Magazine print at the numbers it needed to print out, right? Because like the first issue sells out, I mean, it'd be almost immediately. And they realize that they are gonna have to increase their production scale way beyond what they ever thought was possible. Um, so there's, Ellen Handy and then another uh, scholar, Jason Hill, talks. Uh, one, they talk both talk wonderfully about this rush to get things on the last train to Chicago from New York to Chicago, um, so that R. R. Donnelly can fire up the presses. And what a very rigid timeline this all happens on. Mm -hmm. Now, the printers, what they would do with the layouts is they are taking each of those layouts and turning them into engraving plates. So I've and I haven't seen an actual plate, but I've seen facsimiles of the plates that are at Time Inc. headquarters. So every single page, um, you know, had a plate, a metal plate made for it um, mm -hmm. in order to, uh, in order to run the magazine. So, well, I mean, the, it's kind of a hard question to answer because we only know of about seven existing layout mock-ups. I don't know of any original printing plates. We did try to find them. Um, I think more work could be done there, um, but you'd almost have to have the 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 layout design, the printing plate, and the final you know product to see if any changes happened along the way. But if you're missing any of those components, you might not be able to track the changes. So I think it's a it's a really interesting question. It's just 
it's one of those questions that reminds me of how how much of the magazine making process was really very very ephemeral mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and a lot of those editorial conversations about you know why choose this image over this or why make this image bigger and this one smaller yeah. you know that yeah. was all done around a table and mm -hmm. and we don't have access to that anymore well, did they have a kind of feminist i mean you have margaret Burke white you have you know I saw a picture of a, one of the editors was a woman. Um, was that a special to life more than other magazines at the time? Or, you know, was there? You know, that's a, I, I don't know the, the staff numbers at Say Look, which was life's, certainly life's biggest and, and uh, most important competitor in the picture magazine arena. Um, what we did discover is that there, there are these women who, um, who might not sort of in the typical hierarchical structure of like say the masthead there were women who weren't at the top of the masthead often but there were women who held enormous power so you know someone like um like peggy Sargent, uh who i showed at the very beginning here um you know peggy Sargent saw every strip of film for nearly three decades and she was effectively the gatekeeper the photographic right. gatekeeper and there's these fabulous stories of like photographers would show up at her office and plead their case for like their favorite <laughs> frame of uh, you know they'd be like oh wait go back to that go back to that i got one to show you you know um yeah, yeah. and the photographers uh there's an internal newsletter for staff at time inc and in one of those, uh, that was it was also weekly. Um, and in one of those internal newsletters, uh, they write that photographers feel as though Peggy Sargent holds their career in the palms of their of her hands, right? Because she <laughs> does. Um, and so I think one of the things we left with was a real appreciation that um, although women were often kept in very particular roles, like they were very often researchers or fact checkers, but not often reporters. Um, there was a, a really powerful legion of women shaping the content, but in ways, again, in ways that didn't get celebrated by the typical hierarchy um, mm -hmm. and that didn't rise to the top of the masthead. So, um, but there is, there's in the book, there's a wonderful essay on there are six women photographers um, for Life magazine during the 1936 to 1972 period. We have a wonderful essay by a communications professor about those six women, um, what their work is like and how it how it differed right from one another, because of course they're not they're not uniform. Um, so so that that would be something that someone might be interested in. Um, Someone was interested in how, what was the final subscription readership when life folded, do you know, offhand? When it folds, it's, uh, I think it's dropped just below 10 million. And mm -hmm. then at its height, before we like add in the Saturday evening post sort of bulge, at mm -hmm. its height, I think it's uh, closer to 15 million. I'd have to double check that, but I think that's right. Um, Let's see. How did yeah? This this is a good one to end with. I think with so much material, how did you approach the project without getting bogged down? <laughs> the I researchers' don't know, favorite I don't question. Know what we did I mean, um, there we made this this crazy spreadsheet that I still have of every single photo story that we might ever want to dwell on for the book, um, and. Uh, and it was over 400 photo stories. And each of those photo stories, of course, can have up to like 25 images. So it was a gargantuan list. Um, we slowly winnowed that down. And then at some point we stopped winnowing because we realized that the decisions for what to include were gonna be guided so heavily by the archives. So yeah. there could be a story that I would just love to include but if the archives had no materials left on that story, it became a lot harder to, right. to right. really offer up anything more that went beyond the pages of Life Magazine. Because as I said, you could, you know, you can buy an old copy of Life Magazine, or you know, I have some in my house. Um, you can look at it on Google Books. But we wanted to go beyond just the printed page and really get into these photographic decisions that were guiding the entire operation. And to do that, we really needed to have these discoveries um, 
whether it was a contact sheet or uh, whether it was, you know, crop marks uh, or a layout, but we wanted to have to be able to have some sense of what went on behind the scenes to make the magazine come together. Um, and how did you choose the writers for the different essays? Because it's really um, the way the book is structured is that there's these uh, there's sort of short pages each with an essay. It's quite right. It's, it, I will say for those of you who are curious, it's a, it's, it's meant to be a fun book to read because you're meant to be able to sort of dip in and engage in different ways. So like I said, there's these kind of object treatments where it's like just one photograph or just one spread yeah. and someone goes really deep on just that one image. Um, and then there are like short thematic essays. So there's that uh, great essay on the technology of R.R. Donnelly and Sons Printing. There are these longer essays that are like, you know, like Jason Hills is like what it took to get the news and how on earth did a weekly magazine function as a news magazine when news does not happen on a weekly basis, right? <laughs> it's a fabulous essay because it's a, that's a really big problem that Life Magazine had to solve. It saw itself as a news organ, but it had a printing schedule and it couldn't budge and it had a weekly, you know, it had to appear on right. the newsstands every Friday. Um, and then there are essays that are um, on specific types of coverage. So there's an essay that just is on coverage of uh, wars and conflicts um, because Life Magazine, you know, is effectively uh, birthed on the eve of World War II and its demise is, you know, toward the, the official end of the Vietnam War. So it ends up being in a way a kind of war magazine as well. Um, the, the finding the experts was, was really a joy. Um, a lot of what's happened with Life Magazine is that it's, um, it's been studied by way of individual photographers. So people get really interested in Gordon Parks. They get really interested in Margaret Burke White, but those people don't talk to each other ever, ever, ever. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and then American studies people love Life Magazine, which is great. And they write great scholarship on it, but they don't really care about the photographs if they're being super honest. Um, right. Because for them, it's just illustrative of US history. Yeah. And so there's this way in which the photograph like kind of any photograph could be chosen as long as it's, you know, from the news event that that American studies scholar wants to talk about. And right. so what we really tried to do was put the photographs front and center and make this a book where like Life Magazine, the photographs were guiding the process. Um, right. So I have to say that's been um, part of the fun, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is finding all these other people who were interested in that endeavor many of whom, again, don't always sort of talk to each other or end up in the same book together. Uh -huh. So tell everyone how they can purchase the book. And then I will also send a link, I think. Well, um, I mean, the way I know for sure that you can purchase it is the Princeton University Art Museum store. They will ship internationally if that's relevant. Um, and, you know, it, it does help us keep our staff uh, busy and employed. So we always appreciate that. But I'm sure it's also available uh, on Amazon, um, and uh, and it should because it's distributed. It's it's our book, but it's distributed by Yale University Press. It should also be available, um, I would guess, in certain museum bookstores um, in in France. So I know with my previous titles, they I've seen them. Um, you know, I've seen them at the Jeu de Palm and and uh, other other museum bookstores. So great. Well, thank you so much. That was great, Catherine. Thanks so thank much you all. And thank you for all of the um, attendees. And um, it was great to take a break. <laughs> from other yes, things. now we can all go back and see what's happening, right? We've looked at the news from the last century. And now let's go look at some news about today. Right. Um, so uh, thank, thank you so much. And um, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you. It's been all a right. pleasure. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.